Um, all the Unicorn, there's a vast body of visual evidence. It, it appears in all the right places. In the Garden of Eden, um, this is uh, Bosch on the left. The uh, Unicorns are just up on the two-thirds of the way up, a bit higher on the, on the left. The Unicorn is dipping its horn into water, according to the Physiologus, the vestry legend, that the Unicorn's horn purified putrid water. So the Unicorn is doing kind of act of public service there and, and for the other animals. And uh, Cranax, a very beautiful, sprightly image of the Garden of Eden, with two very nice Unicorns on the right, and you'll see he's differentiated if the male has a horn and the female doesn't. And it's this kind of thing that gives conviction. You know, it suggests that he actually knows that the, it's the male that's adorning the horn and the female are not. So all that is part of this kind of supporting fabric which gives convictions to things. The unicorn, of course, a very sim famous symbolic animal, a famous series of uh, French and Burgundian tapestries on the theme the legend that the unicorn could not be captured by even the most intrepid and skilled hunters, uh, but could only be captured by a virgin, and hence its association with uh, Virgin Mary and uh, other virginal figures, and there indeed is the uh, unicorn coming up, to a, um, coming up to a virgin with the implication. There's also, um, there are ermines and other animals symbolic of purity here, that scene as well. In terms of sheer conviction, of course, Leonardo, David mentioned the dragon, can draw these things with the alchemy uh, naturalistic. These are tiny, tiny drawings of the Ashmolean, the first slightly earlier than the, than the other one, but uh, a slightly smug looking woman saying, Look what I've got. Um, and she's got the unicorn on a leash. Um, and the other one, a very beautiful, subtle, naturalistic rendering think that Leonardo was seemingly bending over to perform it some ritual act of purification of, 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 um, of fetid water, of, of, of dirty and polluted water. Um, it's Leonardo, in a sense, who tells us the recipe for portraying these creatures, and it's a compound recipe, and it comes from the medieval faculty of fantasia, which is combinatory imagination. And the medieval faculty of psychology, the faculties of the brain, fantasia, what became fantasy and became Shakespeare's fantasy, on subsequently, ultimately from the Greek fantasia. Um, but uh, this is combinatory imagination. That the way you imagined, the way you created something was to take and combine the bits from natural creatures. Um, Leonardo says, indeed, if you wish to make your imaginary animal seem natural, Take for the head that of a mastiff, the eyes of a cat, the ears of a porcupine, porcupine the brow of a lion, the neck of a turtle, and, um, and so on. It's a combinatory form of uh, giving conviction to uh, chimerical creatures, giving this level of naturalistic conviction as if you have seen them. Um, the sort of testicles hanging from the cheeks of the monster on the right have a, a real sense of weight and of plastic reality to them. Um, just another example, because you've already seen Bosch, this is Royal the Fall of the Rebel Angels, an absolute melange of combinatory imagination, of putting things together to create this extraordinary spectacle of the, the fall of the rebel demons, it looks like, all the angels. And, and this, uh, very remarkable and utterly convincing picture with a little puffer fish up there in the top right hand corner, which looks as improbable as any of them, but it's actually not un unnaturalistic in its, um, in its particular details. Now for the unicorn, we did of course have perfectly good evidence for it. We have unicorns' horns, narwhal tusks, greatly priced and incredibly expensive. If you look at Renaissance inventories, the, the paintings cost pennies compared with the, uh, the unicorn's horn, which of course Segments had a magical properties, including ones of a, of a sexual nature. Um, that one is a, is a nicely mounted one. It's a, it's a, a German, uh, a German one from the late seventeenth century, uh, set beside the Gesner again. So you know, there, there's good evidence in a way. There are very good descriptions. There 
arrived with this description of the unicorn as a of these other um, fan fanciful, fanciful beasts. A credible woman, of course, Gesner, who's very concerned to get things right. He reports the evidence. He's, he doesn't just gather in all these strange animals without questioning them. He writes about the, the unicorn in a somewhat different way. He writes about the Struthel Camilla. Um, but um, ultimately, he's drawing from Traveller's Tales, from a whole series of things. And as the unicorn becomes in integrated naturalist, we say you have a whole classification of types of unicorns. Um, and the one on the left is indeed from one of the Traveller's Tales. This is Bernard von Breidenbach, the Peregrine. Peregrinations in the Holy Land, the later edition, um, with a series of unicorns and unicorn related ones. I'm afraid that one has had its horn severed at the top, but it does have one. Um, and, uh, and then there's John Johnson, the, uh, the, the British naturalist from 1665. And this all gives a kind of supporting fabric to it. Once you've got a natural history of unicorns and unicorn-like things, some of which are not actually called by uh, the Latin name monoceros, um, then the whole thing assumes this enormous era of conviction, a whole knowledge system builds up around these things, and with nice illustrations. And the illustrations of this are not less convincing than the illustrations of animals which we now know exist. Um, we, of course, are wiser. Or are we? And when I was at the Institute of Fine Arts in New York, the, um, the New York Post, which was, I hasten to add, not my regular reading fair, I saw a copy of it on the underground, on the tube, as one calls it, um, containing this, uh, this article on the unicorn and its baby share in the front page with a framed rapist, and inside a, 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 a Advertisement for Barnum and Bailey. Barnum and Bailey, interestingly, their beginnings, their great beginnings, was in a kind of uh, museum and cabinet of wonders, freaks, and so on, including living human specimens from abroad in, in New York. So they stand at the, uh, within a kind of wonder tradition. But what's going on here? Um, live interview now with a little beast, cute, cute little beastie, and, and convincing photographs. Are they fakes? The people who are parading these, these two things have great, very gratuitously silly names, Morning Glory and Otto Gazelle. Um, and, and we know from Coupier's research that the development of the uh, goat's skull or a skull of uh, an angulus of that sort is not such that the, the cranial sutures don't allow a bony um, horn to grow. So something funny is going on here. What they have done is they grafted onto a fairly fully formed young goat, they grafted on a horn and made it grow in the centre. So in a sense it's a real unicorn, it's growing a horn, but not by DNA, but by surgery.